My name is Brandon Leonard, and I'm Director of Strategic Initiatives for Men's Health Network. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this briefing this afternoon, focusing on uh, elementary school age boys. This is part two in a series on what's happening with boys. And we had the first part back in October, which focused on very early childhood. And we're so pleased that you all can join us for part two today. I want to start by thanking the Congressional Men's Health Caucus for their support for this briefing and for uh, many, many events that we've done on the Hill. Um, and we're very pleased to have today with us uh, one of the co-chairs of the Congressional Men's Health Caucus, Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen. Congressman Mullen represents the second congressional district of Oklahoma and was first elected to Congress in 2012. He serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee where he sits on three subcommittees. Uh, as I mentioned, he's a co-chair of the Congressional Men's Health Caucus. So we'd like to thank him for his leadership on these issues. And particularly relevant for today's topic, he's a father of five, including two boys. Uh, Congressman Mullen. Thank you so much uh, for, um, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it is vitally important uh, to understand the role uh, that we have in uh, young men, as I like to say, young men's life, and understanding what a father or a father figure can be to a child. Um, it's not always what we say with our mouth, it's what we do in our actions. And a lot of times we think we're going to sit down and we're going to talk to these kids which I do. I talk to my five kids all the time. I have a 12-year-old and I have an 11-year-old. Uh, I have a 7-year-old and beautiful twin girls that are, that are five. And I, every one of them is different. There's no manual to say how to be a father or to be a father figure. That doesn't exist. What does exist is your ability to be consistent and be willing to change and be flexible. Be willing to hug the child and tell them how much you love them. Uh, to be able to set back and encourage them but also to correct them, uh, to be the person that's consistent in their life and not in and not out, but also dedicating your time and making them feel that it's important. Obviously, I'm up here 42 weeks out of the year most of the time. My kids stay at home, and I've been blessed to have a wonderful wife that's, that's there with them. But when I am at home, I dedicate my time to them. Uh, when I'm with them, they're number one. And when I'm away, they know that I miss them. I never want anybody to think that what I'm doing is more important than my children. And so for us, as people in the room and those that want to be a father and those that are a father and those that want to be a father figure and mothers, which are vitally important, uh, it, 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 I don't think there's a golden standard that we apply by other than the simple thing of just being there and let them be part of it. Let them understand that everything you do, you do for them. I quit working for myself, which I've been self-employed since I was 20 years old. I quit working for myself the first day that we had our first child. Everything was about their future. And it's multiplied four times since then. So thank you for making it important. Thank you for those that are here, because it's vitally important. It's, their, it's our next generation. It's who's coming up behind us. And what we leave is a legacy of what we see in, or as a reflection of them. That's our legacy. And, and continue to strive, continue to be better, uh, and I pray every day, Lord, let me be a better father today than I was yesterday, and I'm dead serious about that. There's no such thing as a perfect parent. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Mullen. We appreciate you being here today. Um, I also want to recognize... Um, Congressman Donald Payne Jr., who is the other co-chair of the Congressional Men's Health Caucus. Uh, Congressman Payne, Payne, can't, Payne Jr. can't be here with us today, um, but I did want to thank Tom Saunders, who's been an excellent, excellent partner uh, working with us with Congressman Payne Jr.'s office. Um, so we really appreciate all the support from the Congressional Men's Health Caucus and all of the members. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, the staff at Men's Health Network for all their work in making this event possible today. My colleagues, um, Anna Fadic, Kendra Anderson, Sean McCallie, um, thank you all for making this possible. Uh, we have an outstanding lineup of speakers today, and I'm lo really looking forward to introducing them to you all. Um, first, I just wanted to let you know that in your packets you have some great information. You have bios for the speakers. You have uh, a couple of presentations that you'll be hearing here in a bit. 
You also have some background articles relevant to today's discussion. And you have some information about, uh, for us, a very important awareness period that's coming up, which is Men's Health Month in June. So we have some information in there about the month itself and how you can be involved, as well as some information about the Congressional Men's Health Caucus. So for those of you on the Hill, if your boss isn't already a part of the caucus, um, we'd love to, to talk to you about that, and I'm sure Tom would as well. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. David Murphy. Dr. Murphy is a senior research scientist at Child Trends, where he oversees the Child Trends Data Bank, an online compendium of research-informed indicators of child well-being. He also produces the Child Indicator Newsletter, which is a leading publication in the field. David's work has been cited in the New York Times, Washington Post, Time Magazine, and many other major media outlets. Prior to his tenure at Child Trends, David worked for 15 years in state government, where he helped lead Vermont's communities in adopting a results-based framework. He holds a PhD in developmental psychology and a master's in education from the University of Michigan. David? Thanks. Thanks, Brandon, and uh, thank you all for being here um, to join with me and the other panelists in this important topic. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the basic research that underlies what we know about this age group of elementary school age boys. So I'm going to start with this diagram, which depicts an ecological framework, which I, I would suspect that some of you are, are familiar with, because uh, it's, it's really gaining a lot of traction, I think, in, uh, among those who study uh, children. So this, this framework posits that development unfolds within multiple contexts of family, school, and neighborhood, and that those in turn are encircled by the, the wider so social, cultural, economic um, context. And all of these are interacting and unfolding over time. So you see the two arrows at the top of the slide indicating a life course perspective where how you are at uh, middle childhood is influenced by who you were at early childhood and in turn will influence who you will be at adolescence. So I want to I wanna commend particularly the sponsors of this series for taking this life course perspective because it's, it's very much in line with what the research uh, is telling us is important. Now, what I'm not showing here, uh, but I'll be touching on per, uh, at times in my presentation is, is, and you'll be hearing more about this too from our other speakers, is, is the biology of development. So we also know that, that a person's genes and environment are constantly interacting uh, throughout development. So I'm going to put up, put up a number of indicators. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all one by one, but I want to highlight a couple of things. I think probably you've already heard, if you've been to earlier presentations, that compared with girls, uh, boys have higher rates of preterm births, special health care needs. They're more likely to have, uh, be diagnosed with ADHD, to have autism spectrum disorders, and to be in special education. They're more likely to have difficulties with self-regulation and social skills. Now, some of these gender differences that you'll see here are relatively small in absolute terms, but taken cumulatively, they're rather striking, I think. And I'm, I, I will say that um, all the data that I'm going to be showing, unless I indicate otherwise, are for ages 6 through 10. Uh, and the, the primary source of, of these data is the National Survey of Children's Health. Um, so some, some people have s speculated that um, uh, that boys may have a different, what, what's called a differential susceptibility. So they may be more susceptible both to risks, but also more susceptible uh, by the same token to interventions that, uh, uh, that may be brought to bear on making things better for them. So uh, I'll, I'll just put that out there and have, ha have you consider that while we uh, move along. So let's take a closer look at uh, the gender gap at elementary school. We know, as I said, that boys engage in more disruptive behavior than girls do. And by sixth grade, girls are reporting that they are getting more academic support, better school behavior management, more social support from teachers, more peer, peer support than boys are. So I think this suggests that our school climate, uh, you know, uh, in general, is, 
is not adapting well to the needs of boys because by sixth grade girls are already telling us they're getting more of the things that they need than boys are telling us. Similarly, we can look at uh, after school participation, attending religious services regularly, which we know is a, uh, a protective factor for uh, children in this, in this age group. Um, and uh, hours spent reading for pleasure, you know, small uh, gaps in an absolute uh, sense, but again, taken, taken together, uh, these differences do add up. And of course, there are areas where boys are doing well relative to girls. So boys are more likely to uh, participate in sports teams or sports lessons. They're more physically active than girls. And they're more likely to sit down with their family for meals at least six days a week. W we know that that's a pow actually a powerful I intervention, if you will, that, that families take on a regular basis. And research has, has confirmed is, uh, uh, has positive effects on, on the development of both of boys and girls. Now, so I want to turn back to that earlier, have you think back to that earlier slide that I showed about the ecological um, context of development? And I don't think we can talk about this, those uh, those wider that that wider social context without talking about things like racism, about economic inequality, and the other uh, uh, forces that that affect all children, even if it's somewhat I indirect. So. Uh, According to some recent research, we know that police officers are more likely to see black boys as young as 10 years old as being more mature than white boys and therefore perhaps more, more culpable, less innocent. We know that whites are more likely to, to associate faces of black boys, even young boys, with threat than they are the faces of white boys. White teachers are less likely than black teachers to have positive expectations for black boys and see them as less likely to graduate from high school, less likely to go on to a four-year college. And we know that the neighborhoods of black boys are disadvantaged by concentrated poverty, by, uh, by crime, poor housing, environmental pollutants, mass incarceration of black fathers, and poorly resourced schools. So I think as, 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 as many uh, who are participating in the current conversation have noted, including um, the current administration's My Brother's Keeper initiative, we really can't talk about gender without also talking about the intersection of gender and race and ethnicity and some of the other disparities that exist in our society. So let's, let's take a closer look at a couple of examples because in some ways the disparities among boys by race and ethnicity are actually larger than the disparities between boys and girls. So let's take the first case, uh, the, the group of uh, bars on the, on the left. And here we see that white boys are actually more likely than black boys to have a mentor-like adult in their lives. We know from research that having one or more adult figures other than a parent who, who, who cares about you and is willing to take the time to form a consistent positive relationship is, is, a, is an important protective factor. Um, so um, black boys are um, less likely than white boys and Hispanic boys in turn are less likely than black boys to have such an adult in their lives. Let's take a look at the other set of bars, attending religious services, which I remarked a few minutes ago is actually a positive protective factor in the lives of, uh, of uh, uh, children of this age. So and when it comes to, to, to that, black boys are actually most likely to attend, followed by Hispanic, and lastly, white boys. Now, for many boys, as I said, gender intersects with race, with family disadvantage, and uh, poor and unsafe neighborhoods to create what's really often a toxic mix. And uh, we can see here financial hardship is much uh, more common among uh, black uh, boys than it is among white boys. And um, the difference actually between Hispanic and black here is not significant. But when we, we, we can turn to the next uh, indicator of parental incarceration and black boys are more likely than, than white boys to have a parent who's been incarcerated. And then when we take a look at the third indicator, uh, the experience of neighborhood violence, either as a victim or as a witness. Black boys are much more likely than Hispanics who in turn are more likely than white boys to have experienced violence. And note that these are all experiences that are typically associated with trauma. 
and we know that, that trauma creates toxic stress, and we know that toxic stress interferes in many ways with uh, optimal development. So what, what are children, what are, you, what are boys and what are children in general uh, in this age group spend a lot of time doing? No surprise, screen-based media are really assuming a bigger and bigger role in the, in the lives of young children. And actually, television remains the single largest um, source of screen media that, that young kids are spending time with. But more and more children of this age group are owning their own, well, maybe not owning, but having their own cell phones. Um, there's a lot of media multitasking going on. So even though children are spending uh, close to seven hours a day with media, that's crammed into five and a half hours of space because they're multitasking with media. Uh, we know that boys in this age group are, are in particular spending a lot of time, at least many of them are, with video games. And the jury, I would say, is still out on, on the relative balance between uh, advantages and disadvantages of that activity. I think there can be some, uh, some, some downsides to it. There, there could also be some, some upsides, but the jury is still out on that one. But we know that heavy video game usage is associated with problems such as anxiety and depression. So I think we want to keep, keep an eye on that. So let's, as, as we wrap up here, um, let's, let's talk about what children in this age group need, and, and, and particularly our boys. So based on, on what you've seen already in the earlier slides, um, children in this, in this age group, and, and, and boys in particular, need, need to develop stronger skills with self-regulation. They need to have good social skills. They need positive relationships, both with teachers, with parents, and with peers. They need a sense of positive identity. And so, in response to that, if you're working in a program, this is what your staff need to, to provide. They need to be consistent. They need to be fair, culturally informed. They need to offer a variety of activities, and they need to be trauma-informed. And with that, I will thank you and turn things over to uh, our next panelist. Thank you very much, David. And I just wanted to note that we will be doing um, some questions and answers after we've had all of our panelists. So next what I'd like to do is give a brief introduction for each of our four panelists, and then I'll ask them each to come up and provide some remarks based on their experience and their expertise before we go into the question and answer time. Our next speaker will be Dr. Stacia Friedman Hill. Dr. Friedman Hill is a program director in the Division of Translational Research at the National Institute of Mental Health. She is the chief of the Mechanisms of Cognitive Dysfunction Program and the Trajectories of Neurocognitive Funcio Functioning Program. So you may have to explain to us what that means here in a moment. Um, Dr. Friedman Hill has a PhD in neuroscience from the University of California, Davis. After earning her PhD, she was a postdoctoral research fellow in the intramural program of NIMH. Upon completion of her fellowship, Dr. Friedman Hill served as the director of the Cognitive Neuroscience Program at the National Science Foundation. In 2009, Dr. Friedman Hill returned to the NIMH to join the extramural program, and um, I hope that you can tell us a little bit about some of the uh, particular initiatives that you're working on at this time. Dr. Friedman Hill. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, and thank you for the invitation to talk to you today. Um, so, I am looking for my slides. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, I was invited to talk about um, brain development, um, particularly in elementary school children. Um, and um, I could talk to you for hours about this, but I only have a few minutes. So what I'm really going to do is just give you a sampling of different methods we have for studying the brain and what some trends in development are over, um, th uh, over middle childhood, the age that um, children are in elementary school. Oh, great. So my first slide was really just an introduction to remind you that 
Um, in childhood, it's not only the case that children are um, physically growing an enormous amount, um, but their minds are developing as well. There's um, uh, many, uh, many levels of, of growth um, in uh, children's cognitive abilities. Um, and psychologists traditionally have many different conceptual schema for um, characterizing stages of development um, of uh, mental processes. Um, but it's only recently that we've been able to really sort of peek inside the head to uh, look at the brain and uh, understand why cognition and emotion and social processing are changing over childhood. Um, and so one of the very first trends that you see when you start to examine neuroimaging data um, is that the brain does not develop everywhere at the same time. Um, a real, um, one uh, real uh, finding that has influenced the field is that different regions of the brain um, peak and develop and mature at different uh, time points. So if you look at the top of this uh, slide, these are um, schematic diagrams of sort of where the uh, peak maturation of uh, different parts of cortex are. And you can say, for example, motor cortex or sensory areas are maturing um, much earlier um, in development um, in middle childhood than areas like the prefrontal cortex where are they're um, reaching their uh, maturation levels um, sometimes as late as the um, early 20s. Um, and so this is important as well. Um, there are multiple processes that are development. They're not just one uh, process of maturation. Many changes are occurring at the cellular level, at the neural level, um, um, and at uh, grosser scales where you can uh, measure the size of regions. Um, before we delve into some pictures of the brain, we also should consider, um, because I am coming from the National Institute of Mental Health, um, what we know about development and mental health disorders. Um, so in this slide, I really wanted to show you that um, if you just look at the age of onset of um, different types of mental health disorders, you can see that um, they vary widely. So as Dr. Murphy mentioned, um, early in childhood, you see um, uh, the onset of ADHD or autism uh, uh, probably reflecting processes that even occur before birth. Um, whereas as you move into middle childhood and adolescence, you see an increase in anxiety, mood disorders. Um, and then there are some disorders um, like psychosis or schizophrenia that, although they may be the result of early injury to the brain, really don't have their onset until adulthood. And so um, just looking at the, um, the age of onset gives us some clues as to what some of the neural mechanisms might be that um, are leading to a risk for mental health disorders. Um, on the right side, I wanted to show you um, also the um, difference in prevalence uh, rates. Um, and as, again, as was previously mentioned, um, you can see that there are um, uh, different risk factors. So boys are more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD or autism, uh, whereas girls are more likely to um, uh, have an anxiety disorder. Um, and so we should expect that we can see different periods of susceptibility in the brain and differences that are based on sex. Um, the, um, what I'm showing you here, um, and now I'm going to start delving into um, some pictures of the brain. Um, one way you can um, look at the brain is to look at anatomy and structure. And so this is um, a study that was done in the intramural program of NIMH. Um, by Jay Geed and his colleagues. Um, individuals who were age 30 to, uh, age three to 30, um, came in every two years um, and were scanned in an MRI scanner. And that yields anatomical pictures of their brain. And then you can use computers to form these 3D images. And these are colorized. Your brain obviously isn't, isn't these colors. But the warm colors are showing um, areas which you have a peak in gray matter volume. Um, the cooler colors are showing um, uh, decre uh, decreases in gray matter volume. And this is an example, too, of the heterochronicity of changes. Um, again, if you look, for example, um, at um, some regions that are uh, yellow in the beginning of, uh, of development, early in development, age five, age three or five, you can start to see um, how gray matter uh, decreases. and. Um, it doesn't uh, decrease at the same rate everywhere. <clears throat> now I'm going to really start going fast because I'm told I only have a few minutes. Um, so this is um, other measures that you can pull out from the structure of the brains are looking at white matter, looking at um, um, uh, 
um, the whole uh, uh, size of the brain. And in this figure, I just wanted to show you that we can find differences between boys and girls on average. So the blue lines, especially the blue, the bold blue lines, are the mean of um, of different volumetric measures from boys. The red are um, different structural measures from girls. And you can see that there are differences um, uh, across development and uh, differences for different changes. The little arrows on the bottom are showing you where the peak of development is. So in general, boys' brains have um, uh, um, uh, higher volume metric measures, but the girls' brains are showing peaks at earlier ages. Okay. Um, also, um, when you look at structure, in addition to looking at size of things, volume of things, you can look at the connectivity. So regions in the brain are connected by the axons of neurons, these fiber tracks. Um, this is an example from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, in the top row, those are um, the brains um, of um, male uh, in subjects, participants who are age 8 to 22. Um, and that's uh, um, average across all those ages. And the second line uh, is the uh, brains of females. And what this is showing is that there's a change in connectivity patterns. So the male brains are showing more connectivity um, from different regions that are in the same hemisphere of the brain. The females are showing um, increased uh, connectivity between the same region but in different hemispheres of the brain. Um, so, so far I've only been talking about brain uh, structure, but we also have um, different neuroimaging measures to look at function. So activity in the brain, not just static structure or the hard wiring. We can actually look at changes that um, reflect the physiology. Um, and so that is called functional MRI. Um, I just wanted to give you a, a couple of really quick pictures of what you can do with this. Um, the reason it's interesting is that you can actually measure brain activations while the individuals are doing a task. Um, this is an example from Damien Fair. Um, it was a study of children who have ADHD and children who don't. Um, on the uh, left-hand side of the figure, he looked at which parts of the brains were active and correlated with each other while the subjects were just resting, not really doing anything. Um, and the bottom row, um, line B on the left, shows some differences between the ADHD children and the, um, the healthy controls. On the right side, he then asked them to do a task. Um, they did something called um, delay discounting, Essentially, children are asked, they have to um, make a choice, and the choice would either be associated with um, a very small but immediate reward, or it would be associated with um, a larger reward, but they would have to uh, wait a period of time to get this reward. Um, children with ADHD um, uh, typically go for the small, immediate rewards, and so um, a region in the brain which is associated with uh, reward system, the nucleus accumbens, changes its connectivity when, uh, with prefrontal cortex, um, and that's associated with their performance on this kind of um, reward task. Um, I also just wanted to mention that there are some researchers like Vinod uh, Menon at Stanford who are looking at academic skills and how these are correlated with um, activations in the brain. Um, he has been looking at uh, reading tasks and uh, mathematical ability. He's found consistent regions in the brain that are specific for reading, other regions which are specific for math. Um, and he finds that children who um, uh, perform poorer on um, reading or math, have less activations in these regions, less connectivity between these regions. And the really um, intriguing finding from uh, Dr. Menon's lab is that uh, he can look at the effects of tutoring. So um, he had a study where children underwent an eight-week period of one-on-one -on -one math tutoring. And after that, he actually found that the regions which were implicated in um, uh, mathematical um, problem solving um, showed an increased connectivity with other regions and that also increased activation. And then this is the last data slide I have. Um, I also wanted to touch on um, so um, how the environment can um, affect brain, um, both brain structure and uh, brain activations. Um, so this was a study from Elizabeth Sewell at um, UCLA, and she uh, measured, in a very crude way, um, socioeconomic status. She um, was uh, quantifying it by looking at a family's income um, expressed as a proportion of what the poverty level for a family of that size would be. And she found on the left that um, 
um, certain brain regions like the hippocampus and the amygdala actually uh, were associated with um, uh, different volumes depending on socioeconomic status. And then on the right, um, she also shows um, other regions that there's an interaction of age and development with socioeconomic status. <clears throat> And so in conclusion, what I really wanted to do by showing you um, this brain imaging data is to suggest that we know a lot about um, that the, uh, how the brain is changing over time, which regions are changing. We now know which regions of the brain uh, underlie things like attention and memory and learning and even specific learning like reading or math. Um, and we also have the ability to measure uh, changes over time. And so this might suggest for you um, regions that um, might be sensitive um, for, uh, for training or interventions, and also special time periods where the brain is changing a lot and where um, time periods where um, we should consider whether there is plasticity and we should really focus our interventions during particular developmental ages. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedman Hill. So we've set up the panel to take you from um, some of the excellent research that you just heard about into practical applications. And our next speaker is very well suited to talk about this. Uh, Dr. Charles A. Barrett is school psychologist at Loudoun County Public Schools, where he has been working for since July of 2008. He is actively involved in the training and development of future psychologists and serves as an internship supervisor as well as chairing the training programs committee on diversity. Additionally, he serves as adjunct faculty in the Department of Psychology at George Mason University and Northern Virginia Community College. To influence the manner in which school psychology is practiced, Charles has presented at various national conferences and has been featured in publications sponsored by state and national associations. His most recent publication, What About Me? School Psychologist and the Least of These, challenges school psychologists to serve all children and families, especially those who do not have a voice or who are unable or unsure of how to advocate for themselves. Charles graduated with honors from St. John's University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology and English. He later earned a Master of Education in Human Development and a Doctor of Philosophy in School Psychology from Lehigh University. Dr. Barrett? Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share with you. Uh, the panelists so far, Dr. Murphy, Dr. Friedman Hill, certainly have laid some good foundation for me to speak about just how this looks at a regular school, public school in Virginia. So I work in Loudoun County um, in a pocket of the county that primarily serves lower income Spanish speaking students, uh, two elementary schools, K through five, a middle school, six to eight, and a high school. And for me, no day is the same as the previous day. A lot of fun, a lot of things go on. Um, but working with boys in particular, I'm gonna just highlight a couple of things that certainly stem from what was shared previously. The first thing is that although a lot of research has been done about uh, boy behavior, how the brain develops, things along those lines, unfortunately, it doesn't translate to practice as nicely. So there is still this huge disconnect of those who serve boys, work with boys, families, not understanding these differences in brain development. And unfortunately, our expectations sometimes of boys might be inappropriate for their level developmentally. Where I come in or how I'm involved in that is typically through some kind of pre-referral intervention process, but also testing children for disabilities. Um, it might be in your packets, but some work I've done over the years looks at the difference in perspective from assessors or raters, parents, teachers, how we interpret behavior, how that leads to differential outcomes for the students that we're serving. As uh, Dr. Murphy sh um, shared before, certainly we have these different perceptions of boys or black boys in particular um, that oftentimes leads to disability or disorder, various diagnoses that at times are not the best answer if we knew some things or uh, thought about 
developmental expectations and appropriateness um, differently. That's one thing that, that I, I think I see, or I know I see, working with boys in different uh, public school settings is that the expectations or uh, the perspectives from those working with them oftentimes are not um, as appropriate as they should be. The second thing that I'll share is that, um, again, developmentally, um, the Congressman, I think it's Congressman Mullen, shared that there's no playbook, no rule book about how to parent and how to make these decisions. We kind of learn as we go um, along this process. But even one year sometimes can make a huge difference in a child's trajectory over their lifespan and educational success and outcomes. I've worked with boys, um, two in particular, that started school at an age that was appropriate, uh, but they could have waited a year and started school a year later. So here they are now in class with boys who are sometimes 9, 10, 11 months older than they are, or girls, and we're comparing a child whose brain is still developing, the maturity level is not there, and they look more impacted than they really are. Um, so sometimes the parent knowing, well, I could keep the kid home for another year, give him some more time just to develop some maturity. It's not a matter of their cognitive potential or their cognitive abilities, but developmentally they're not ready for certain concepts. Um, and the school, if they're not careful, could prematurely identify this child as being disabled or disordered. Um, the young man I worked with a couple years ago, he was in second grade and was about a year younger than his peers. And on, in the classroom, he looked impacted, looked disabled, but if that same child was in first grade, which he could have been, but you know, he starts school early, there will be no problems, no concerns at all. It just depends on the reference group that we're at times comparing boys to. So I think knowing that, and of course, how do you know that early on before the kid now is in kindergarten or first grade having this difficulty? So I think this ecological model of people appreciating the contribution of medical factors, community factors, telling parents these things ahead of time on the prevention and uh, rather than intervening um, is certainly very helpful. Unfortunately, I'm going to talk about something that uh, happened in Loudoun uh, this year, uh, but it kind of frames uh, the last thing that I'll say about boys in general is that mental health is clearly the next frontier for schools to tackle um, in a very deliberate way. I think we've done some things well in other areas. Prevention and academic skills are, I think we're pretty well on our way in those areas, but mental health is clearly the next frontier that we need to um, identify and really tackle. There were uh, four suicides completed this year in Loudoun County, which is huge. Uh, we might get one a year, but there were four this year, two in February, and three out of the four completed suicides were males. Um, these were older kids, they're not um, six to 10 or six to, but they were typically in high school. Um, so the manner in which we, we start to respond to the mental health needs of boys in particular is going to be our next challenge um, as public school, um, public school divisions. Uh, we can do things, most kids that complete suicide do have some underlying mental health difficulty. Typically depression or anxiety that has not been treated effectively. Um, the school is in a great place to provide these kinds of support systems and services to um, mitigate those factors um, that should not end in a child taking his life. So just a couple things, I think, to just to recap, the perspective that we have on boy behavior, be it teacher, parent, administrators, how that impacts their outcomes. Developmental maturity is huge for all kids, but especially boys, and the manner in which we can prevent some of the things by uh, being more cognizant of that is gonna be huge. And then again, uh, mental health, um, a mental health focus for, again, all kids, but especially boys, is certainly our next big opportunity in public education. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Barrett. Oops. So, okay, no worries. Um, so our next speaker, I actually wanted to mention uh, a connection and um, Lisa Gordon, who is, 
uh, unfortunately not feeling well, so she couldn't be here today. But um, Lisa spoke at the first, at the part one briefing back in October. She's with Bank Street College of Education and actually was very instrumental in bringing uh, two of our speakers, um, Charles and our next speaker, Principal Eric Bethel, to the briefing today. So um, she'll, she will see this video eventually and I want to thank her. Um, so our next speaker is Principal Eric Bethel. He is a native Washingtonian. He attended Mount St. Mary's College for both undergraduate and graduate school, earning a BA in sociology and a master's in elementary education. This is his 14th year in education, all serving students in the District of Columbia public school system. He spent his first eight years teaching third through fifth grade at Marie Reed Elementary School. And in the summer of 2010, he was awarded a fellowship to work in the DCPS central office as a teacher central to leadership fellow. This experience broadened his perspective on education reform and led to him serving DCPS students and teachers in a variety of capacities, including master educator, assistant principal, and now principal of Turner Elementary School. And um, for those of you who are at the first briefing, Lisa spoke about a program that's been piloted at some DC public schools, including Turner. And so I hope that uh, Principal Bethel will have a, a moment to talk about that a little bit. Thank you, Brandon, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I stand before you as the proud principal of Turner Elementary School, a pre-K to fifth grade campus that is housed in a beautifully modernized facility, though nestled in the Congress Heights neighborhood in Ward 8 Southeast. This is a neighborhood um, that is amongst some of the highest rates of poverty and crime in our beautiful nation's capital. Turner is one of DC Public Schools Chancellor Henderson's targeted 40 schools, which simply means we're one of the lowest 40 performing schools in the CPS. If there were a targeted 10 list based on student achievement metrics, we would be on that list. With over the past two years, students are performing at 1% proficiency levels on a state standardized test. Even more compelling of a data point is that 60% of the students performed at the lowest of five levels on that same performance metric. Nearly two years ago, Chancellor Henderson tapped me and asked me was I up for a challenge. I told her absolutely. And since then, I've been a, uh, the principal at Turner, charged with leading a school-wide transformation. In the two years that I've been leading this effort, a lot has been uncovered in terms of the challenges. Some of the challenges include attracting and retaining teacher talent, it includes engaging families effectively, providing the right academic interventions for elementary school students who are already at a deficit, one, two, three, grade levels behind, and you're just at third or fourth grade. But none of those challenges has been more layered or more compelling or I feel demanding of more of an immediate response than what we're learning about the impact of stress and trauma associated with poverty on students, mental on students' mental health, their brain development, their readiness to learn, their social and emotional disposition, their behavior. It's absolutely striking what we see on the ground as, as stress and trauma plays out on children's lives. Here's a little bit of what we see. So actually, let me take a step back and explain a little bit about what are some of these stressors that we've identified that students have. On a very basic level, basic human needs. Some of the stress that come to the my students at Turner really revolve around simple eating habits. For both you and I, you have control over when you're going to eat. You're probably on some sort of routine. I know my son, who's three and a half, eats every single evening, pretty balanced meal most of the time at about seven o'clock. But for lots of my students that live in poverty, they're not quite sure when they're going to eat or what they're going to eat or how they're going to eat. That is stressful. That level of stress has an impact on their brain development, on their executive functioning, and it plays out in their opportunity to engage in instruction in the school environment. Other simple aspects of life, sleep. Am I sleeping? Which house am I sleeping at tonight? 
do I have a bed tonight? Am I sharing that bed tonight? Am I on the floor? Am I sleeping at 10 o'clock because I have a structured routine that puts me to bed at 10? Or is it sometimes 11, 12, 1? All of these sorts of things play out and make for a stressful environment. So what it affects, and what we see it affect mostly, and a lot with our young males especially, is on their ability to self-regulate. That is, have self-control, that is, manage their emotions, manage change, um, and participate positively in a school setting. It looks like this in a classroom, the ability to sustain engagement in instruction. It also looks like difficulty managing social interactions, conflicts, disappointments, things that we can't account for, like a typical day often throws at us, a schedule change even can trigger students that are under stress and trauma in a um, negative way. We frequently see in our male students um, triggers that escalate students to one of three behaviors, freezing, fleeing or fighting. And we typically see it, especially in our males, flight or fight. So we have a lot of cases of students that escalate to what we call crisis in our, in our just in-house school language, but basically disruptive behaviors that trigger into either property destruction, a flip of a desk, a tear down of a bulletin board, a throwing of the schoolwork that they're engaged in, or physical aggression that mounts in Peer fights, sometimes, you know, assault with no or minor, very minor injury, but that sort of behavior plays out when students that are under stress or trauma are triggered. And it happens at a high rate in high poverty settings, even at the elementary school level. What I've learned most in this two years is that the start of this work are really conversations like this because we have a large number of adults that are not necessarily trauma stress informed and I'm not talking about just adults stakeholders outside of the school even amongst educators in the school teachers spend a majority a lot of their time learning about pedagogical approaches how do I best teach division of fractions how do I best design learning experiences that will help my students grasp certain content or concepts? Very little in my district and in my, at my school at this point in time is geared around helping teachers, educators become trauma-informed so that we can develop the skills, the tools, the mindset, and the response to students. But it also plays out in the families and the parents who are also not necessarily stress or trauma informed. I had a conversation just this week with a grandmother who said, Kevon just needs a good old, a good old grandma discipline. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, in actuality, it's, so grandma, yes, his property, that he got angry and tore down that bulletin board and that is not an appropriate response that we want him to have but that's signaling that there's something much more. And no one really, we're still beginning the conversation about what stress and trauma, what that impact has on students, and that's, that's a real, it's something real to acknowledge, it's something real to plan around and support students around. So what we begin to do is we begin in my school community to just become that, trauma-informed and engage our caregivers and families and parents around stress and trauma and what to do with their students and with their children about it. And one, one pilot that we were really proud of last year, as Brandon mentioned at the beginning, was partnering with Bank Street. And so we engaged families in the attempt to raise awareness and essentially inform them, build um, capacity so that there was more of a sensitive approach that parents are ready to accept and recognize that, hey, maybe that traumatic experience that we know child A um, um, experienced and went through is having an implication. And we do need to accept that maybe treatment or individualized modifications to the instructional program is the right course of action and not just, you know, traditional um, um, 
grandma love. And same with our teachers. We partner with Bank Street to help teachers really get a, a, a key understanding of what the student experience may bring and how to be responsive to that. And one of the, 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 the best tools that came from this experience of beginning to become trauma informed was a, what we call a strength based approach to working with students. And that simply means instead of targeting on the deficit, Kivan's disruptive behavior, <laughs> that we're actually looking at what are Kivan's strengths, what are his interests, what does he excel at, and let's build his support around those. So Kivan is, Kivan takes charge. He has the strong personality. He's a, there's a little leader inside of Kivan. So instead of only building supports around stopping disruptive behavior, let's get Kivon connected with our peer mediation program or our junior recess coaches, and let's leverage that when we need to have conversations about leader-like behavior or um, to engage him in school in a way where he is connected. At the end of the day, we've learned that we need to be a buffer in the school for the stress because the stress is real and it exists and a lot of times in the school setting, we don't have control over what's happening outside of the school. But we can be a buffer. And if we can engage students around their strengths, around their interests, and create a positive setting for them, we can kind of buffer that stress and channel um, support, treatment, therapy, the things that they're, that they're gonna require through, those, um, through that lens. And that's been our biggest work to date. We're really at the at the uh, emphasy level, I would call it, in terms of understanding this work. But um, we feel like conversations like the ones we're having, great research like it's being shared by the experts here, really is helping to inform practice and shape, shape the direction in the way that we approach this work. And thank you for your time, and I'm um, glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Principal Bethel. So our next panelist is Ernest Clover. Uh, Mr. Clover is the director of the DC Dream Center. He provides leadership and vision for the activities at the DCDC. Um, he actually got uh, his, had an internship on the Hill back in 2007. And during that time, he volunteered at DCDC where he would later return to be a mentor and now director. He earned his master's in international relations from the University of Denver, and he and his wife live in uh, Prince George's County, Maryland, where they're raising their son, Dylan, and we're very excited to hear about some of the connections to the work that you're doing in the community. All right, thank you so much for being here. My name is Ernest Clover again. Uh, I had a little bit of blood rush because there's a hole in the floor here. My seat fell in, so I want you guys to maybe shake a hand of a neighbor, get your blood flowing too. Uh, why don't you go ahead, shake your hand of your neighbor, introduce yourself. I know it's after lunch, so I don't want anybody. That was my wake up call. Oh, yeah. So I, I appreciate you all being here. And uh, what I get to do is um, we're stationed in Southeast DC, 2909 Pennsylvania Avenue Southeast. And we're on the main ferry through where we've been for 20 years is kind of that linchpin underneath undergirding our schools and our community right there. So we fall in this sector of uh, mentoring and tutoring as a, we have after school programs. The, the research that you presented, Dr. Murray, that's amazing because that's what we see. So I want to just get very specific through stories. I, I want you guys to really identify with what we do. So I've been a mentor for six years to the same young man. His name's Isaiah. He is a senior at Anacostia High School. When I met him, he was 12 years old. He does suffer from ADHD. Now, this is the one thing in, in the community that we've seen. Community is splintered. And I, and I want you just to remember the diagram that you so aptly showed us is because you see all these, the, the Venn diagram and all those concentric circles. So one of the influences for our youth in our community isn't there. 
right? It's just not there. So we're coming in and providing mentors. So that's what I get to do. And some of the things that I experienced in those early years were simple things. A lot of our youth in our community only experience dinner or food in general through carryout. So sitting down at a table and maybe having table manners wasn't something that was taught. Now, I know there is a generational gap with that grandma love, as you so aptly put, Eric. So they're like, oh, the, the kids ain't got no house manners. And it's like, well, who's going to teach them? No one's been here to teach them. So when I was with Isaiah, we went out to B. Smith, used to be in Union Station, in lower level. And, and the interesting thing was is we order. And he said, they, they didn't take your money. I was like, yeah, because we place our order, then we eat, then we pay at the end. And it's those little things that I realize that as a mentor, we step into the gap to teach and bracket and put a, a little bit of a Band-Aid and some healing ointment on this wound that is the splinter of community where we are. Uh, something else I would just like to share that we have seen is that it does take more than just one mentor. So while I was with Isaiah, um, my 10 hours a month, and I made a one-year commitment, but obviously it's been six years now, um, there were also a group of men who came around me and him and I, them and their mentors and mentees as well, where we would tag team and be together with them. Because we realized that, A, we needed some support as men. Like, hey, did, did your mentee do this? Or am I just the crazy one? Or did I just do something wrong? And, and B, what did you do when said experience happened? And so that's some of my early experiences with the mentoring program. I just want to a little bit transition into what, what I'm doing now in the leadership role at the Dream Center is that literally, I wish I could tell you guys something that the, the research being done, everything else has let us package something where we can do a thousand kids at a time in a big conference hall, but it doesn't work that way. It's one person at a time. So one person at a time, the DC Dream Center wants to inspire and equip youth and adults to reach their God-given potential. So that's what we get to do now in my leadership role. So creating the programs that could come around this community to really help them cope with some of the fractures and the splinters that have happened. Um, a number of our males in our community who are adult age, unfortunately, have some sort of hang up or habit that is not conducive for them to be the male role models or the fathers that they should be. So we realize that while we work with the children, and, and we and again, I'll, I'll go to our after school program, because perfect example, we have a young man there named CJ. Um, I realize that when I work with CJ, he's at a school uh, right down the street, Randall Elementary. He comes down, he's with us for three hours. The vast majority of his day is gonna be with an adult, one of which uh, who has some bad habits, his father, and is like, well, that's where he's gonna pick up a lot of this. So we realize that as a staff, that's what we're fighting against. And we realize that while CJ, and I, and I love what you were saying, Eric, as, as well as uh, Professor Murphy, uh, Dr. Murphy, and, and Dr. Stacia, I love what you were showing with the brain because we realize that as we try to work with CJ, it's like, okay, there's some cognitive delays. There were some bad decisions made by some adults that, for example, this year he wasn't in school for four months. There are also some other things that happened that just weren't right for CJ, but he is a collateral damage. So we realize that in our role, it's not to uh, castigate or put him down, it's to build him up and to pull out those things that we see that, because there are leadership talents and there are things like that that we see that we try to speak over our youth to encourage them in that because unfortunately in their environment they won't have that. That is not the routine. And I, we see it up throughout because like I said, Isaiah is 19 now. Uh, so we also uh, work with high school age as well as young adults in their 20s. And we see these hangups and these issues still present. They are still there. They don't go away. It's just that the guys are better at hiding them, is that they're better at just shutting down and maybe walking away because they're a little bit older and they have a little bit more autonomy. But the issue is still there. So um, I'm, I'm just happy to be here, Brandon, and I, I got my cue for my time. And I want to leave a lot of time for a Q and a So I really appreciate you guys. And thanks for being great sports and shaking your neighbor's hand. Really appreciate that as well.
Thank you very much, Ernest. Um, could we have another round of applause for all of our speakers? So we've left some time, um, happily, for you all to answer some questions since we have such an expert panel up here. And I have some in mind, but I want to give you all a chance to ask some questions if you have them. So anyone? So a uh, question for Dr. Barrett. Um, you mentioned that um, schools are the next big frontier for mental health. And I'm curious what um, specific things you think schools need to have the resources to do Speaking to this, uh, sure. uh, so I would say a couple things. Um, can you repeat the question? Yeah, can you repeat the question? Oh, sure. Uh, the question was, um, I mentioned that um, mental health is kind of the next big frontier for schools to to be addressing, and what's, the question was, uh, what specific things can schools do to respond to that need? Is that correct? Okay. Um, so there are a number of things. Um, you know, personally speaking. Uh, we want groups, for example, I might see a group of boys and talk about coping skills or boys with depression or anxiety, things like that. But I think the scale at which we need to be addressing these needs needs to be much more comprehensive. Um, a large part of my job is still spent with evaluating students, you know, so testing them, IQ testing, or going to meetings for pre referral team, eligibility meetings. Um, so certainly I can't. Um, respond in the way that's necessary. So I, I do think it's partnering with more community support agencies um, to come in and lend their expertise in counseling. Um, we do refer a lot of our students to uh, uh, folks in the community for counseling services, but I think it's a much more systemic organization that um, brings counseling services to schools, not necessarily provided by school personnel. Um, I think that's um, probably the biggest way. Um, I think the other thing is is just um, working with fathers in particular about what mental health looks like for their sons or for their children. I dealt with a father a couple of years ago. The son had some significant anxiety, and the biggest issue was not working with the son. It was working with the father that this wasn't about weakness or man up. It was about he can't help this, and he needs therapy, he needs counseling, he needs medication. So I think it's, it's also doing much more education to families about what mental health looks like in a young boy, in an adolescent boy, um, but also, again, partnering with other agencies to bring those services, kind of going to a full-service school model, that it's not just about reading, writing, math, but it's also the total social-emotional uh, well-being of the child. Just a quick, just a quick build um, on what Charles just shared. There's a key need in a school for capacity, mental health clinicians available on site to service students. I, I see more and more part, more and more organizations emerge that are looking to fill that need with schools. As a principal on my staff budget. I have money for a social worker, money for a school psychologist, yet I have 59 students that we've already identified that are receiving either group or individual treatment or therapy, and there's not enough capacity in the school building to provide that. So we do look for partners, and it's difficult to, um, we've had a hard time of connecting parents and families and students to outside organizations, so take your child to this office to get this treatment on this day of the week versus having in-house mental health clinicians available to pull students from class to provide that kind of group therapy for like like challenged students or individuals so i do see it playing out where the school is is becoming more of the central location for us for some of the mental health work so i had a question that um, any of y'all are welcome to answer but maybe uh, dr friedman hill if you could start um, can you tell us a little bit more about the process of translational research and how we get from the kind of basic research that you presented into uh, the practical application that we see in schools, for example? Um, 
Sure, so let me explain what is translational research um, and then how do we get um, to uh, um, mental health interventions that are school-based or even uh, distributing information to parents and teachers. Um, so at, the very, at one end of the spectrum, we have very basic research that's uh, research maybe in um, healthy individuals, research in animal models, trying to really understand just basic neuroscience. Um, what translational research is, is to take it a step further. Once we understand more about the brain and um, uh, neurotransmitters, <coughs> structure of the brain, um, we can identify um, uh, patterns which are disrupted. So what is the difference between someone who's typically developed, uh, typically developing versus um, children who are at risk or experiencing mental health problems? So the very first step in translation is really characterizing differences. Um, and the next step is once we characterize a difference, understanding those as targets. So the reason we want to understand what the mechanisms are is we want to target them for intervention. So the next step of translation is to um, come up with uh, uh, interventions that could be pharmacological, they can be behavioral, um, they can be cognitive uh, training, the things which will actually work on those targets um, and cause changes, um, which is one of the reasons why we're interested in tracking these changes with something like neuroimaging. Um, once we can establish that um, an intervention makes the changes both in the behavior of the individual and is addressing the biological mechanisms, then we're ready to move it into um, a clinical trial where we're going to look at efficacy, we're going to look at um, uh, eventually how we deliver these interventions. So at one end of the scale there's basic research, on the other hand we have interventions and services. Um, one challenge I think though that I'm hearing from my fellow panelists is also um, we may do the research to show what are effective interventions but um, that is different than um, having access to those interventions in the community. So um, children who are experiencing mental health problems, um, there's issues of where are they screened? Are they screened in school? Do they have um, yearly visits uh, with pediatricians who are asking questions about development so we can screen for mental health? But also, um, where are they going for services? Um, how are they gonna pay for that? Um, where are services available to them? A lot of this actually moves into other agencies outside of the National Institute of Mental Health or um, agencies like SAMHSA and um, other uh, community and state-based agencies, which um, one of their uh, biggest challenges is how do we get those effective interventions um, into the hands of families that most need them. Um, so at the Dream Center, how we address this is uh, most of our services are provided for free. And what has happened to our community relationships is that we have people who come to us who have training or skills and saying, hey, I know there's something new and kind of know about your community here in Southeast. I would like to offer my skills, my gifts, my talents for you and your community for free. So this is how I think from a community standpoint, people are beginning to address this mental health issue is that people are already doing it as practitioners, but because they can come here and they say, all right, I can share my time, talent, and treasure through this industry of DC Dream Center. I want to do that, and this is how I'm best suited to do it. And we want that because we realize that this is the next frontier. So again, standing shoulder to shoulder with our schools and our community, we also want to be able to provide some additional help for the family and the child as well. Uh, I'll just add one other thing, which is, it's kind of a common sense idea, but it's also one of the most difficult, I think, that, that we've seen, and that is, we need to reduce the stigma around mental health. We need to understand that health is inseparable. It's a single thing. It's not mental versus physical. You know, the brain and the body are both involved in all aspects of health, and the stigma that still surrounds mental health is a huge barrier toward people getting the services that they, that they need. And it's a barrier for, uh, for parents in developing an adequate understanding of uh, their own issues or their children's issues. Uh, so as a society and as individuals, we all need to, I think, work on that.
So um, many of you spoke about working with um, not just the children, but with adults um, to understand the trauma that children are dealing with. And I imagine that behind that are a lot of adults who haven't been able to deal with their own trauma. Um, could any of you comment from your perspective on how you've seen that play out, play out and what either on a very small or large scale seems to work and kind of getting the message through to these adults who have an impact on their kids' lives? I can share a couple of things. Um, people always ask me about how the kids are doing. I said the kids are fine. It's the big kids who really have the issues. Teachers, parents that really set the stage for what or model for what um, children do. Children are resilient, but they still model what they see at home, what they see in school. Um, so I think especially for young children, or you call it even elementary school, it's not so much always direct intervention with the child. You know, after they leave school between 7 and 3.30 or whatever the times are, they're still home with a parent, caregiver, in the evenings, on the weekends, all summer long. Um, so that person really is poised to do a lot more at times than what the school can do in our temporary access to the child. Uh, I think it goes back to the questions that we just spoke about is connecting the family to a system of support that can not only address the child's behavioral difficulties or mental health difficulties, but mom and dad are not talking well, um, mom and dad are uh, unhealthy physically, mentally, all of that in some way trickles down to the child. I worked in Baltimore City for a year, a couple years ago, and a bunch of boys in school, and almost in every instance, there was in some way, the child would tell me that their acting out behavior was a function of, I can't see my father. So before we intervene directly with the kid, that's not the kid's fault. It's parent, the mom, the dad are not on the same page in some way, but addressing those family kind of systemic or more ecological needs, um, I think becomes the work of various providers that eventually have the lasting outcomes for, for the child in school or in general. I'll also share a bit about our experience in terms of gauging um, parents and caregivers um, around these topics. Um, I think as uh, Charles just shared, we have, I mean, it's very layered and nuanced when you deal with each individual student and their families. You have sometimes disconnect between the parents. You some, uh, what I experience a lot with, especially our students that are most at risk, is you do find that there's untreated mental health in the um, in some of the caregivers or providers, or you may find that um, a child has spent um, a lot of time bouncing around in sort of foster care. You also have a lot of times um, untreated substance abuse um, in the family and other caregivers, and that alone creates a very um, unique set of challenges to try to work through when, then also trying to increase awareness and support from the, the, the child's um, guardians. <clears throat> As it relates to the successes we've had, we, um, over a course of a year, developed a series of both morning and after school sort of workshops for parents of just our early childhood students. So we really wanted to target one cohort and we wanted to go, um, you know, follow the model knowing that early intervention is at its best. And, and what came of those conversations or just parents having an opportunity to share about their experiences, express what they are, their fears are, what their aspirations for their child, children are, and their, what they're dealing with on the day to day. And I think that alone created a little bit of more um, connectedness to the school, trust with the school, and as a result, we've been able to have some of those families agree to go through certain intake processes with some of the community partners, the mental health um, partners that we, or um, social work services that we, that we do have access to. 
Um, it's like I said, it's very nuanced, it's very layered and very tricky, but we have had some levels of success um, in getting both attendance and action um, from parents. Yes, and I would say for, for us, what we have come to realize is that people will be a part of community whether it's healthy or not. So what we try to do is create environments where people are enticed and are welcomed in uh, to where we are, at 29 on Absolutely Avenue, where the Dream Center is, and say, all right, we're going to have a Moms Night Out for single moms. So we're going to provide free child care, a meal, and then we're going to bring in a guest speaker to help teach you about parenting skills. Or uh, maybe it's a pamper night and you're just going to have fun tonight. Or maybe it's how to juice and what, what's the best way to do that. So bringing them into community and letting them share around their commonalities and also building on them is what we try to do in, in meeting those needs because um, like Eric just said, it's very layered and there's a lot of different players throughout each layer that do have connection with the family and the adults and the children. It's really trying to bring them together and, and in creating environments like a mom's night out or like an after school program where people start sharing life with you we then hear about these other players and perfect example is being a mentor invited into a council with a parent uh, a social worker and then someone from the school and it was like hey we want all of us to finally get together i've heard about you i've heard about the issues so let's get together for the sake of this young man and, and that's when you begin to start seeing the change when everybody's kind of holding each other's hand and saying, all right, I'm here, I know you're here, and now we're actually gonna to work together for this individual. And like I said, it's one person at a time. Um, so it's, it is very time consuming, and I know we're a very result-driven uh, society, but I, I can tell you I've seen the results when you really are intentional with the one-by-one -one model. That's, that's what it takes. I just wanted to add a few words about um, trauma and neglect and early life experiences. So one thing um, that we know from research is that very early life experiences can have effects much later in life. Um, for example, we know studies of children who um, were in large institutional orphanages when they were uh, babies and toddlers, when you study them later <laughs> on in life when they're teenagers, um, uh, systems which are involved in emotion regulation, areas like the amygdala and the connectivity with areas which are involved in emotion regulation, um, are, um, they are um, disturbed, they're not what they should be. Um, they also may have problems with processing emotions, um, uh, uh, with their social relations with other people, with being able to regulate their emotions. And so one thing that, uh, Jeff, that I also wanted to plant was that um, very early experiences can cause stress, which have much later effects in life. Um, but also we need to remember that the children that we are seeing today are going to be parents themselves, and we need a lot more research on how does your experience and how it shapes your social and emotional processing also affect um, uh, how you parent um, a generation from now. Um, there's also genetic effects when we consider families. So um, disorders like ADHD, um, there's real high heritability, uh, which means that uh, if you have a child with ADHD um, and problems with um, emotion regulation, they're very likely to have at least one parent who also has a disorder. And how does that affect their ability not only to follow up on interventions, but just their day-to-day -day life in the family? So this is primarily targeted for Mr. Clover, but anybody else is welcome to hop in as well. So um, you're, you mentioned a lot about the one-by-one -one model, and it seems to work. Do you see once you get to a certain uh, point in a, in a single community with that one-by-one -one model that the community itself begins to do what your organization tries to do on its own? So if you get a certain number of people um, who have table manner skills, then it starts to spread throughout the school on its own. Look, a, a critical mass, and I'll just re quick repeat the question is, um, by doing a one-by-one -one model, do you anticipate, do you see happening people owning what you teach and then thereby going out and being ambassadors for that? Yes, we do. Um, but the thing is about in DC is that it's a very transient area 
where we are. So we will maybe have a, a, a child through the elementary age, but then they will go on to high school or junior high somewhere else throughout our city. And then so they might move or they might move to Prince George's County. So it's very transient. So we realize that we don't have people from cradle to grave or anything like that. So we try to teach as much as we can with the time we're given. So that in the attempt of knowing that they're gonna go someplace else and they need to teach this to someone else. We wanna train them up for that. And as we begin to transform our community, um, so it's in our radius um, of where we are, we're in Ward 7, and uh, there are a number of apartment buildings, again, increased transient nature of what's happening there, but also there's a generational gap. So there's a lot of people who live in Randall Highlands and the Penn Branch neighborhood who are senior citizens who are beginning to kind of age out. So there's a new generation of folks coming in and buying. So um, I'm seeing that we're gonna to have to keep doing this because there's new people coming and it's, and it's very interesting to watch the changes in our community, but it's uh, great for us because there's a school right down the street, a block, two blocks away is Randall Elementary. So we have great access to a lot of youth right there. And so I would say, yes, we do train on people when we see that it, it happens where people do take that out and be our champions but uh, we realize that they probably won't be in our community for long. Um, I think we take one more question, if there's one. Uh, uh, Mr. Brown, and, uh, what's, the, what's your staff buying to what you're trying to get done? Um, so, this, <laughs> The question is, what is the level of staff buy-in to the work that we're trying to do around informing on trauma and responding to, to students, particularly our males? Um, we're leading a large change process in my particular school, right, where a school is underperforming across a, a variety of metrics. And so there's a high rate of expected change and lots of initiatives that we're rolling out to staff at one time. So as it relates particular to this, the staff is becoming more informed. They are shifting their mindset from a lens of either sympathy or um, just not understanding to being much more empathetic and seeking the tools and skills they will need in order to appropriately respond and serve that community. So, but that shift is, is slow and a whole year's worth of work, we're starting to see it play out and say teacher actions, teacher language, and that sort of deal. Um, I believe the level of commitment is high and I believe that everyone um, recognizes this as um, a landmark challenge for our school community to reach the levels of success we want. Do you, have, uh, do you have resources to maybe do uh, professional development things like that? We do. We have resources. Um, so, you know, lots of those resources don't come by way of, you know, say the district gives us a menu and say choose from these five great resources, which one you want your school involvement. But they mostly come from um, really grassroots conversations. They really come from us seeking partnerships like the one we sought with Bank Street. They came in and worked with our early childhood families and teachers for a year. Um, um, it looks like grant opportunities like the one we just wrote and submitted for a Males of Color initiative to get, um, I believe, $25,000 to then use towards professional development for teachers. So resources are there. Um, finding them and getting access to them is a bit of work. All right. Well, I think we're almost up on time. Um, I just had a, a couple of other thank yous uh, to close. I wanted to thank um, one of our key advisors, Dr. Jeff Evans, um, who's retired after a long career at the NIH, and we appreciate his support always, and especially for making the connection with Child Trends so that we could have uh, David Murphy here today. Um, I wanted to thank Charlotte Armstrong for working with me um, on short notice to get Dr. Friedman Hill here today. I really appreciate that. And um, Adam Buckaloo, who uh, was until very recently working with Congressman uh, Mullen on the Men's Health Caucus, 
who is now with the Energy and Commerce Committee, who introduced us to Ernest Clover. So I want to thank all those folks for making this possible. Uh, I want to thank you all very much for coming today. And looking ahead, we are planning to have a part three. The series will continue, uh, date and time TBD. But we are looking to have a discussion on adolescence in part three and perhaps a part four to talk about young adulthood. And so thank you all. Thank you, uh, Tom. Thank you to the congressman, uh, to Congressman uh, Donald Payne Jr., to Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen and the Congressional Men's Health Caucus. And I hope you have an excellent rest of your day and, and afternoon. And have a great weekend.